in this lecture we are primarily going to discuss multidimensional arrays how do you do array manipulations when an array is defined to have multiple dimensions matrices in fact are two dimensional arrays so we'll specifically discuss matrices and their manipulation because in all your subsequent science and engineering curricula large amount of numerical computation that you would do would involve matrices we will specifically look at matrix multiplication today at the end we'll discuss another interesting notion of random number generator this is a precursor to a simulation problem that we shall be attempting to solve in the subsequent lectures so so far we have seen one dimensional arrays of integers you will recall we had roll 100 marks 100 and so on instead of defining an array as an integer i could define it as a float or double in which case each element can hold a float value or a double value etc i can also define two dimensional arrays by merely adding one more dimension after the first square brackets for example int a 10 10 now this represents a two dimensional array which has 10 rows and 10 columns so 10 rows and 10 columns you will agree that resembles a matrix which is a 10 by 10 matrix of course when we say int each element must be an integer element it is not possible for an array to hold one integer value in one element a floating point value in another element etc all elements must be exactly of the identical type which is what is declared an element in the array is referenced by simply writing the name of the array followed by an index for the first dimension and an index for the second dimension so a 4 3 as is written here will represent which row number and column number in our conventional sense third row and second column or fifth row and fourth column please remember that the array indices move from zero to max value zero to max minus one value so if there are 100 elements the last element is 99 and the first element is zero consequently a reference to an index of 4 will actually mean the fifth row in a natural number calculation first second third fourth fifth and this would mean fourth column arrays indeed occur naturally for example the computer screens in front of which you sit in the labs actually consists of small points which are called picture elements or pixels it has a number of pixels in rows and columns and you get a feeling of continuous picture because all the columns simultaneously exhibit a property of a color and intensity so each pixel essentially holds a value which is color or intensity value if instead of a two dimensional picture if i had a mechanism to project a 3d picture or 3d image then an element of that three dimensional image would be called a voxel and it would be determined by three different values each representing one of the dimensions take for example marks of students in different evaluations in this course itself we have quizzes assignments mid same end same we have seen how roll numbers of the students could be stored in a single dimensional integer array but i could for example declare a two dimensional array suppose we have roll number and marks for quizzes assignments mid seven and sem so here is the representation that i have shown here where on the left hand side the roll numbers are 1501 1502 1501, etc as you already seen so that is let's say one array that i define as a single dimensional array but the subsequent marks which are written against each roll number 
Remember, we saw this as a record for a particular student. Now, all those marks together could be stored in an array called all marks. It would have 100 rows corresponding to maximum 100 students, let's say, and it will have as many columns as we have the different evaluations. Here I have shown four columns, quiz, assignment, mid-sem, and end-sem. So I could define an array called int roll 100 and another array float all marks 104. This would mean the second array is a two-dimensional array which has 100 rows and four columns. Each of the columns can hold a floating point value, but it is our interpretation that the first column shall contain the quiz marks, the second column shall contain the assignment marks, etc. Obviously, at the end of the course, one would like to total up all the marks obtained by every student. I could then define another array to hold those. However, it is important before that to consider how will you access different elements of this array. I have shown two elements. The first element is the fifth element of the array, which is referenced as role 4. It is vital for you to remember that C++ starts counting the elements of array from 0 and not from 1. It's a very tragic thing to occur, in fact, because in all our computations for arrays and their indices, we always start with natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When Carnegie and Ritchie defined the C programming language in early 70s, they somehow started counting from 0. Now, that is all right in most circumstances, but when it comes to array indices, we have to be extremely careful because in a mathematical notation, whenever we write A, I, J, we automatically mean I, th row and J, th column. However, A, I, J in C++ would mean I plus 1, th row and J plus 1, th column. So as long as we remember that and provide for it in our computation of indices, we shall be okay. So similarly, you take the larger array, all marks 100 by 4. The fifth row, second column element is all marks 4, 1. Here I have tried to show another array, one dimensional array called total marks 100. Total marks 100, which you may believe, is supposed to store all, some of all marks scored by every student. So there are as many rows or as many elements in this, as many students are there. You will notice that I have shown fifth element of total marks 100, which is referred to as total marks 4, because the index will be 4 for the fifth element. And we would like to ensure that that element contains a value, which is the sum total of all the marks in the fifth row of the all marks array. Is this clear? How will you store value? How will you represent values inside at the index computation value? Of course, there is one inadequacy. Here, the marks which are shown here, presumably representative of our course, do not contain marks for an important component of evaluation, which is that the project. We have quizzes, assignments, mid-sem, end-sem, but we don't have projects. If you want to include projects, you will need to add one more column. Consequently, an array appropriate for storing marks for this course students would have to have five columns and not four columns. So here is what I have defined, row 100, n students, i, j as integer, and all marks 100 by 5, and total marks 100 as float. You are already familiar with this simple level of array manipulation, where I first read in the number of students, and then for i equal to 0, to i equal to n students minus 1. That is why the condition i less than n students. In increment of 1, indicated by i plus plus, for each student, I have to read the five marks associated with that student. So I start another iteration for j equal to 0, j less than 5, j plus plus. What does iteration within iteration mean? The execution will start with i equal to 0 in the outer loop. You will come to the for statement, 
that for loop will be executed for j equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which means that the statement c in all marks i j will be executed for all marks i 0, all marks i 1, all marks i 2, all marks i 3, and all marks i 4. Then the inner loop will end. You will go back and I will be incremented by 1. And then you will read the next student marks, the next student marks, etc. So whenever you have a two-dimensional array, you can actually access all elements of a particular row by setting up an outer iteration which goes over the row numbers. And inside that iteration, for each value of i which represents a particular row number, you can have another iteration which goes over all the columns of that row. This is a standard practice in handling two-dimensional arrays. So how do you access array elements? For example, we want to solve the problem of finding and printing total marks for each student. We have read all the marks. So we set up that iteration again for i equal to 0, i less than n students, i plus plus. For each student, I start with a total of 0 marks. Just like you initialize sum to 0 before adding to that sum incrementally over any iteration. So I start with sum equal to 0, which is total marks i equal to 0 for ith student. Then in that total marks i, I add all marks for that student, for which I set up an iteration over columns varying j from 0 to less than 5. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And I say total marks i is equal to total marks i plus all marks ij. Remember, the marks are now represented by an element of a two-dimensional array. So I'll have to refer to that particular element as all marks i j. The value of the j comes from the inner loop, but the value of the i is static for all execution of the inner loop, which is the outer loop value. So you will agree that at the end of inner loop, I would have compiled the total marks for i s student. So at the end of it, before going back for the next iteration of i, which means before going back to look at the next student, I will print the value of total marks for that student. And that is why you have the C out statement, which prints the ith roll number and the total marks i. You will agree that beyond this point, there is nothing going to be added to total marks i, because i is now going to change once and for all. This is a standard method of setting up a nested iteration to access all elements of a two-dimensional array. In this particular case, we have accessed them first in the row order and for a given row going over all the columns. So it's the row column order. I could have easily done the other way around. I could have done column row order also if I wanted. However, that will not make much sense here, particularly in terms of printing the marks of the total marks of the ith student if I do the jth column first and the ith row later. We now turn our attention to matrix. Matrices are two-dimensional array. We call arrays as compatible arrays if they're the second dimension of the first array or first matrix and the first dimension of the second matrix are same. You all agree that such matrices can be multiplied with each other. So consequently, if I have an array m by n, which is a matrix A, and another matrix B, which is n by P, then AB, which is matrix multiplication of A and B, which will be the resultant matrix C, will be M by P matrix. All of you agree with this? This simple stuff, all of you know matrices. More specifically, if C is A by B, then every element of C is defined by the summation as indicated in the formula. You all agree with this then? C i j will be equal to sigma of a i k multiplied by b k j. So for a given value of i and j, you go over all values of k. Which values k will take in terms of matrix, the middle dimension is n. So k will vary from 1 to n. So when I sum up all the matrix elements, all the, uh, all the multiplication elements going over the middle dimension from 1 to that maximum value, which in this case is n, 
I would have found out the i comma jth element of the resultant matrix. How do I implement it in a C++ program? Simple. I can use exactly the same formulation, but I have to remember that whenever matrix A, for example, is m by n, then the number of rows and columns in that matrix will be indexed by 0 to m minus 1 and 0 to n minus 1. Consequently, when I say sum over all k, in conventional mathematical formulation, k will vary from 1 to n, which is the common dimension. But inside C++, I must vary k from 0 to n minus 1. Simple stuff, once you understand it, it is slightly difficult to remember because that is not how we naturally index matrices. But this is how C++ does and we are stuck with that convention. So the matrix multiplication program could be written by first reading all the matrices. Next, we compute C as per the formula that we just now saw. Namely, every element of C, i comma jth element of C is actually summation over k of a i k multiplied by b k j. We already know how to set up iterations. We know how to set up iteration within iteration. So we can easily set up a nested iteration where the outer iteration, let's say, varies i, inner iteration varies j, and inside the inner loop, I could add up the, I, I could now have another way of, of, of summation of iteration which varies k. So I will have three nested loops. You have to watch out for indices and the input output that you do because the matrix input output in this particular case, when you calculate C i j, this will be calculated for a specific value of i and a specific value of j. But calculation of C i j itself will require an additional iteration. So we'll have to correctly remember where to put our output statement and so on. C i j in our program will be output as soon as we compute it. We could hold till end and have a separate uh, double iteration to print values of Cij, that's a matter of choice. So here is the matrix multiplication algorithm. I have not written this in the conventional program, include IO stream, etc., etc. I hope by now you all know that that's the standard stuff. So henceforth, I will try and keep showing you only the relevant portion of the algorithm. It is to be assumed that this does not make the complete program. You will have to write the appropriate paraphernalia and in fact, return zero, close, etc., etc. Sometimes, if space permits, I will do that, but otherwise, this shall be the model that we'll use. So, when I come to this point, I presume that arrays A and B have been defined and have been read in. They've already been, you've done the input function, so you got A, you got B inside the computer's memory. Now, I set up an iteration for I. I varies from zero to less than M, in steps of 1. Inside that, I set up another iteration for j, where j varies from 0 up to p minus 1 in steps of 1. Consequently, when I come inside the inner loop, I have some fixed value for i and some fixed value for j. And I am guaranteed that any time I come here, I will come here with different value of i and different value of j. And all values of i and j will be covered. So I know that at this point, if I set up another iteration to compute the corresponding multiplication value for i comma jth element of c, I am safe. Look at how that summation is done, the sigma over k as we talked about. Here, I start with setting up c i j to 0, and then now I run a third iteration, which varies k from 0 to n minus 1. Recall that n is the middle dimension. So this, in fact, represents sigma k over 0 to n minus 1 in steps of 1. And what am I doing inside that iteration? For every value of k, I pick up a i k and multiply it by b k j. And whatever is the total multiplication that I get, I add it to the existing value of Cij, which is the element I am computing. So notice that Cij, that element, the final element of the product matrix, 
will start with value 0 which is set just outside the iteration for k and within this iteration I will go over all the values of k such that I will do that sigma correctly. When I come out of the inner iteration, I would have computed Cij. You agree with that? I would have correctly computed Cij. I can therefore output that Cij element, which is what is done by the word C out Cij. When I come over the next brass, effectively, what iteration I have finished? When I come out here, See, when I come out of here, I have finished the iteration for k. When I come out here, I would have finished what iteration? Iteration for j. That means all columns I would have covered. Consequently, this C out statement would actually print the ith row, first element, second element, third element, etc., etc., for all the p elements, 0 to p minus 1. And then I am just putting a new line here so that the second row of the C matrix starts from the next line and so on. So is this clear how you can do matrix multiplication? What is important here is to remember that you keep in mind the multiple iterations that you execute and you keep in mind the correct index reference and index computation. Knowing that indices vary from 0 to something minus 1 where something is the size of that dimension. In this context, we consider magic squares. All of you are familiar with magic squares? Those of you who haven't heard of them, a magic square is an n by n square matrix where the sum of elements of every row and every column is same. Does magic square exist for n equal to 2? Anybody? Is there a 2 by 2 matrix where you can put in integer numbers such that the sum of rows, sum of columns, you can't have it, right? But for 3, you can have it. For 4, 5, 6, etc., you can have it. Here is an example of a 3 by 3 matrix. 8, 1, 6, 3, 5, 7, 4, 9, 2. You add numbers in any row or any column, you get the value 15. Additionally, if you add the numbers in any one of the main diagonals, that will also add to 15. 4 plus 5 plus 6, 8 plus 5 plus 2. This is an interesting mathematical entity that has been known for very many centuries to mankind. The first reference appears in a Chinese reference where these were called low shoe square. They were actually attempting to solve a different complex problem and they figured out that the solution depended on the layout of certain things according to such magic numbers. A 3 by 3 magic square is also, was also known to Indians because during Vedic rituals references are seen. More recently in the 10th century AD, uh, there, there, there is a magic square, 4 by 4 magic square in a Jain temple at Khajurao. The Europeans learnt about magic squares through Arabs who actually supposedly picked up this from the east and spread mathematics everywhere. Doesn't matter what the source is, the magic squares are interesting. There are algorithms to create magic squares of any given n fairly complex mathematical structure has evolved around magic squares. Those of you who are interested can go and look up Wikipedia. It has huge amount of useful information on magic squares. Why are we bringing it here? Here we will try to solve a simple problem. If somebody gives you a square matrix, n by n square matrix, you have to determine whether the contents in that square matrix add up to a fixed value or not. So essentially what we are going to do is we are going to look at the concept of matrix manipulation accessing various elements and find out how to calculate sum of rows, columns and diagonals. And if all of those sums turn out to be same, a fixed value, 
which incidentally is known for any n through a formula. We shall see that shortly. So if the sum amounts to the same value, then we know it's a magic square. So determine if a matrix is a magic square. I define a matrix as square 20, 20. N is the n by n matrix for which I will read the value of n from outside. Ij and sum, Ij are indices which I will use to go over the rows and columns of the matrix. Sum is just a value which, which, which should be the value of all rows and all columns sum. Additionally, I define things like R sum, C sum, D1 sum, D2 sum. Can you guess what these would represent? R sum will be sum of a row. C sum will be sum of column. D1 sum is diagonal 1 and D2 is diagonal 2. We can take any one of the diagonal as 1 and 2, it doesn't matter. I set sum equal to n into n square plus 1 by 2. Incidentally, that's the formula for the constant sum of either row or column or diagonals of any n by n magic square. So I need to ensure that every sum that I compute should be equal to this sum. Here is how I calculate all the sums. For i equal to 0 to n minus 1, and for each value of i, for j equal to 0 to n minus 1, I do the following. R sum is R sum plus square ij. C sum is equal to C sum plus square j i. So what am I doing here? I am calculating the sum of ith row by adding all j elements and putting them together in R sum. What am I doing here? Yes. What does C sum mean? Any idea? Well, C sum supposedly denotes column sum. But what is C sum doing inside the inner iteration? So what will be the value of C sum at the end of this particular iteration, first iteration, let's say i is equal to 0, what will be the value of various, uh, what will be the value accumulated in C sum? First column will be added. At the end, when I go out of this, I am calculating d1 sum plus equal to square i i, d2 sum plus equal to what? This is the question mark that I have. What will this do? D1 sum plus equal to? This will take the main diagonal. Please note that the sum so calculated have to be checked against this sum. I have not included those if statements here. If any one of the sums that I so calculate does not tally with sum, then I will have a problem. Actually, this algorithm has major problems. I am surprised that you are not indicating that problem. Will it be all right to calculate C sum like this? Is there a single R sum and single C sum? How many rows and columns does a magic square have? N. If it is an N by N magic square, it has N rows and N columns. Note that the sum of all elements of every row and of every column must be equal to the original sum. Consequently, I must accumulate the sums for each row and sums for each column. Will my declaration R sum and C sum be adequate then? Because it represents only one value. If I go through all these iterations, R sum and C sum will have only one value. R sum I am initializing before the J loop starts. Am I? I am not. So if I complete all the iterations, what will happen at the end? I will get the sum total of all elements in both R sum and C sum, which will be meaningless. What is the correct solution? Okay, he is saying that you initialize R sum and C sum within the I loop and check for them. It will work for R sum because I is going over rows. So uh, for every row, I can initialize R sum, sum over all the J elements for that row and then compare that sum. But I cannot initialize 
C sum, that is column sum, at the end of I, unless I compute things differently. C sum plus square J I will calculate C sum correctly for which column? Because inner loop is varying J for a given value of I. So for first row, second column, first row, third column, first row, fourth column, what does it do? Is second column, zeroth row, second column, first row, zeroth column, second row. So C sum will calculate correctly the sums for which column? Ith column. So R sum and C sum as written here would correctly reflect the sum of Ith row and Jth column. Ith row and Jth column when I come out of this iteration for just J. Consequently, his solution, which is correct, is to set R sum equal to 0 and J sum equal to 0 just before the for loop. Those of you who are not able to figure this out should actually have to work out. In this specific example, I am just going to discuss how do you calculate the diagonal sum. So you will agree that I am adding something to D1 sum is the first diagonal at the end of J loop. Because the diagonal really does not require two indices varying independent. One diagonal is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. So whenever I have an iteration for I, I can calculate the sum of that particular diagonal by just adding up I, Ith element of the array. This is what is being done in D1 sum. Please note that instead of saying D1 sum equal to D1 sum plus square I, I, I am using D1 sum plus equal to square I which is the increment operator. The question mark is, what should be D2 sum plus equal to? So forget the adding up of rows and columns. Let us just concentrate on diagonal sum. You agree that D1 sum will correctly calculate the sum of all elements of the diagonal represented by 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, n, n, n minus 1, n minus 1. Right? So what should be D2 sum B? What should accumulate here? How are terms of a row added? R sum is R sum plus square ij. So for i equal to 1, j equal to 0, 1 and 2, for a 3 by 3 example, the ij, this is 1 comma j, because i is equal to 1, and j will vary over 0, 1 and 2. So the square 1, 0, which is 3, square 1, 1, which is 5, and square 1, 3, which is 7, will all be added here to get you 50. This is how you calculate the sum of a row. So notice, this is the outer iteration which fixes a value for i, which is 1 in this case. And this is the inner iteration which varies j from 0 to 2 for n equal to 3. And ultimately, I'll get the sum 50. Similarly, you can work out how the column sum is calculated in exactly a similar fashion. But it is important to remember what our friend said, that r sum and c sum must be initialized just before the J loop to get you the correct value. And they must be compared with the correct sum before you go over and go to the next row or next column. However, we come back to D2 sum. Once again, D1 sum is calculated as square I comma I. If that is so from the previous slide, then how are diagonal terms sum? So here is that statement which he said D1 sum plus is equal to square I, I. This will add what? Square 0, 0, which is 8. Square 1, 1, which is 5. And square 3, 3, which is 2. Here is the quiz. So while summing the main diagonal elements square I, I, some of the other diagonal D2 sum can be incremented by the term which... I start with D2 sum also equal to 0 initially. Square n minus i plus 1, i. Square n minus i, i. Square i, n minus i minus 1. And none of these, this must be done inside the earlier loop for j. 
So let's see how many people think A is the right answer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. How many people think B is the right answer? A few people there. How many people think C is the right answer? A very large number. How many people think D is the right answer? Oh, there are one or two people who think D is the right answer. Here is the analysis of the answers that you have figured out. Actually, I will try what uh, uh, my colleague Dr. Sahana Murthy once mentioned. I don't mind spending two minutes just on this experiment. Those of you who gave different answers, if you are sitting next to each other, use two minutes to convince your neighbor how your answer is correct. So just talk to your neighbor and find out whether your answer and the neighbor's answer was same. If it was same, keep quiet. If not, discuss, argue, and convince your neighbor that your answer was right. Of course, there is a danger. If both you and your neighbor had the same answer, and that answer was wrong, then you have nothing to convince. So please argue with your neighbor in any case. Even if both of you have given the same answer, try to find out what was the reason for giving that answer from your neighbor and convince yourself that that argument was right. Now, not enough discussion taking place. Or oh, you have no neighbor, so you are not discussing with anybody. Come on, come on, come on. Convince him of your answer. Even though it is same. Why is it same? Why is it, why is it correct? Why do you think it is correct? Oh, this is not a joke, by the way. It's a very serious business. We are going to have such quizzes after the mid -sem. Remember, that time you will not be raising your hands, but you will be pressing a button on a clicker device. So your neighbor won't even know what answer you gave. And occasionally, I'll ask you to do this. Convince each other, and then again answer the quiz. And I will keep the second answer as your legitimate answer for marking. So there is an advantage in discussing, yeah. No, no, discuss with your neighbor. So raise hand for both the cases when I, when I ask. Okay. So at least some discussion has happened, if not much. So now let's go over the quiz again. When I sum the main diagonal element, square i i, the d2 sum, what should I add to it? Square n minus i plus 1 i, so how many people think the answer is A? Please raise your hands. Ah, two people. How many people think answer is B? Please raise your hands. One person. How can there be one person? Because everybody is supposed to talk to a neighbor. So either you convince the neighbor or neighbor convinces you. There cannot be only one, one person giving any one of the answer. It has to be no pairs. So this time is okay. But next time, you keep arguing till either you get convinced or you convince the other. Don't fight political battles, but mathematical battles. How many people think the answer is C? Ah. And how many people think the answer is D? Nobody. There are some people who genuinely believe that there are two correct answers to this quiz. Let's analyze exactly what happens by looking at how exactly what exactly do these values mean? So here is an analysis of the quiz problem for n equal to 4. So I have taken n equal to 4. I, I, when I am putting up the main diagonal sum, I, I will take value 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. That is very clear. I will get the sum of all elements across the main diagonal. If my answer is A, then for n equal to 4, n minus i plus 1, when i is 0, will be 4 minus 0 plus 1, and i is 0, so the first element added will be 5 comma 0. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. 5 comma 0, 4 comma 1, 3 comma 2, 2 comma 3 will be the answers that I will get. Will that be the right answer? No. In fact, I am not even referencing a valid element of the array by putting that index value. Let us look at the next one. n minus i, i. For n equal to 4, 
and i equal to 0 the first element picked up by the summation will be 4 comma 0 the next one 3 comma 1 next one 2 comma 2 last one 1 comma 3 is that correct is there any element called 4 comma 0 in a 4 by 4 matrix in c++ no elements are start with 0 1 2 3 0 1 2 3 the reason this is wrong is that the first element referenced is not a valid element and that is why this choice is also incorrect the next one says square i n minus i minus 1 this when you put i equal to 0 1 2 3 you will get the indices as 0 3 1 2 2 1 3 0 isn't that correctly the second diagonal that's the reason why that is the correct answer. The last answer says that none of these, this must be done inside the earlier for J. This is meaningless because I is varying, J is also varying. So if you put a diagonal summation inside, you will get some extremely funny results there. So we call it meaningless. By the way, whenever you write any algorithm involving matrix multiplication, you should be doing this kind of exercise. Just to confirm, looking at the extreme values, whether your indices are moving correctly or they are not moving correctly. Before we go further, to look at, so is this clear, how you handle matrices and matrix uh, uh, indexes particularly? So the right expression is d2 sum is equal to d2 sum plus square i n minus i minus 1. This is what we had written in the quiz. However, Notice that I can use another symmetric expression. So I can say d2 sum is equal to d2 sum plus square of n minus i minus 1 and i. This will calculate the sum of the same diagonal elements but going the other way around. Is that clear? So either of these two will work. For n equal to 4, this symmetric equivalent will add terms in a different sequence with index values 3, 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 0, 3. And this will still get you the correct sum of that diagram. The reason for going so elaborately over the seemingly simple problem is to ensure that we understand the intricacies of index value computation and index value variation in C++. All of this stems from the unfortunate fact that the first row is called 0th row, first column is called 0th column and nth row is called n minus 1th row in C++. This is tragic, but we have to live with it. Large programs have been successfully written to do matrix computations involving uh, these kind of indexing. Whether it is C++ or Java, this is the standard way of doing it, and it is better that you, your mind gets accustomed to this almost naturally. As I said, before going further to the random numbers, I would like to just draw your attention to the fact that matrices are extremely important. Later on in your subsequent courses in engineering and science, when you do numerical analysis, in the numerical analysis you will find matrices to be extremely useful. It is not merely for conventional matrix manipulation. There are complex computations done in engineering calculations, for example, solving partial differential equations, a system of partial differential equations. It is not always easy to find an analytical solution. Many of such systems are solved through complex numerical analysis methods. One of the methods, for example, is finite element method, where for the structure on which you have these elements, you actually consider that a plane is con consisting of large number of finite elements. And just, just like you did the summation of areas under the curve, you do something for solving those partial differential equations. I am overtly simplifying it, but suffice it to say that very major design issues in the modern engineering are solved through such complex computations done in finite element uh, uh, methodology where you solve systems of partial differential equations. So you do structural analysis using this. People who are going to do civil engineering, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, even chemical engineering, 
structural analysis heavily depends upon these kind of computation. Here is an example that I want to show you. When you design a car and build a car, you have to ensure that if the car crashes against something, either another car or a wall or a tree, then it will not hurt the passengers inside. So consequently, the cars are actually crashed after manufacturing to test how do they break. Obviously, they will break differently every time you actually crash them. But initially itself, you would like to confirm that they will break in a certain pattern. The car crash pattern is often analyzed using finite element techniques where you use these matrices heavily. Here is a picture of the model of a car crash. So it's a 3D model. This is not the picture of a normal car. What you see here are shown as elements as they will behave when the car crashes. Using this kind of methodology, you can simulate car crashes. You can simulate car crashes without actually crashing the car. Of course, you don't know exactly, but you know to quite a good extent how the car will behave when you crash it. There is a case of an Indian car manufacturer where each car actually has to undergo physical crash tests. And it was not uncommon for such car crashes to be conducted 10 to 12 times, taking over a period of year. Because after every crash, the manufacturer has to go back, redesign the faulty elements, and come back with the car. This particular car, which was designed in India, they used heavy simulation for the first time, and they could complete the certification exercises with only half the number of average physical crashes that are required. And they could complete that exercise in three and a half months instead of one year. So you can see the enormous amount of cost saving and time saving that such beautiful maths can give you. And to do that beautiful maths, you need to master handling matrices. This incidentally was a record time in the world at that time. We'll very quickly discuss the notion of random numbers. We're not going to use it today, so the examples will follow subsequently. But just to see where random numbers are. You're all familiar with the randomness that happens in the world in variety of human activities. For example, if you play any games of chance, you're familiar with card games, so when you deal the cards, you effectively get some card randomly out of the deck of 52. When you throw a dice in a game of snakes and ladders, you'll get a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, but that's a random number. Every time you throw a dice, another number may come, and equally, probably, any of the numbers can come. Such random numbers are called uniform random numbers, because the number is randomly chosen from the same set, and each number has same probability of occurrence. Can we use computers to simulate any game of chance? Yes, but if we do, we'll need to generate random numbers. Now, anything that we generate using a computer can be done only using a specified algorithm. That means we write a program, and that program, when executed, will generate whatever sequence of numbers that you want. Unfortunately, for a fixed algorithm, if a starting point is fixed, the same sequence will be generated. It may appear random when you execute it first time, but next time you run that algorithm, it will give the same random. So how would you like in a snakes and ladder, you always get 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, because that was the sequence that was generated by a particular algorithm. You don't want that to happen. Therefore, such algorithms, by the way, are called pseudo-random number generating algorithms. That means the sequence is not strictly random in the random sense, but it is pseudo-random because it is generated by a fixed algorithm. To simulate true randomness, what you do is you run the same algorithm, but with a different starting point. And if you start with a different starting point, then you may get a completely different sequence. If the sequence is large enough, say multiple million values, then obviously the sequence will not repeat, and effectively you will get random numbers. This is the crux of using some initial seed value, you can generate different sequences. C++ specifically provides for generation of random numbers. For example, if we want to represent generation of toss of a coin, head or tail, 
I need a random number generator which will keep generating randomly either 0 or 1. Or you could call it 1 or 2. Or you could call it 5 or 6. Or 0 or 10. Whatever. Two numbers. Similarly, if you want to simulate the throw of a dice, you need a uniform random number in the range of 1 to 6. Whenever you throw a dice, you get either 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6. So how do you generate these? C++ standard library, which is called CSTLib. C standard library. This standard library include all the computational functions that we had once mentioned. Additionally, it includes a function called RAND. RAND, open bracket, close bracket. It does not take any parameter. So every time you call a RAND function, a new random number is generated and given to you. Obviously, it is a pseudo random number. And as we already know, the number sequence that is generated depends upon a seed value. So if you run a computer program 10 times, Ordinarily, you'll get the same sequence 10 times. To avoid that, every time you can set up a new seed value, for which there is another function, which is called srand. So this is seed for the random number generator. So initially in your program, you take one seed, set it through srand, and then if you keep executing rand again and again and again, you will get sequence corresponding to that seed. Consequently, for different program executions, you can actually start with a different seed and get different sequences of random numbers. Here is an example of a program to generate random numbers. So include IOStream, CSTDLib, using namespace, STD, etc. Int main for int equal to int i equal to 1, 2, 4, sorry, 1 to 5 plus plus i. C out ran and L. What will this generate? This will generate a random number. How many random numbers it will generate? Yes. It will generate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 random numbers. Please note that random number generated is an integer number. The full integer is 2 to the power 31 minus 1. So this will generate very large numbers. We can't do much with it. Whenever you throw a dice, you can't get any one of those numbers normally. So you want to restrict the random number so generated within some range. This can be done by using this rand, but doing something different. So I'm simulating dice throw. What is the difference between the dice throw and the normal random number? The dice must get me value between 1 and 6. So here is how I do it. I Generate the random number and find out modulo 6. What will modulo 6 of any integer give me? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. If I add 1 to it, I get the normal dice throw. So that is how I say dice is equal to this. And I can output the value of dice. However, every time when I execute this program, I want to start with a different seed. And to set up the seed, I read a value of seed and I say srand seed. This function execution will set up a different seed value. I have shown some executions here with seed equal to 1, 2, 3. Another execution with seed, different seed, you will get different value. Notice that you are getting 2, 6, 6, 1, 4. This is what actually will happen if you throw it only 4 or 5 times. So how do you know it is uniformly generating random number? That is, the distribution is uniform. Well, you should generate 1,000 times, 6,000 times, 10,000 times. And find out how many times 1 is generated, how many times 2 is generated, etc., etc. This is done by the next program. What it does is, it defines a sum array of 6 elements. Every time a dice is thrown, it will add the corresponding element of that sum. It will increment it by 1. So I do the, exactly the same thing that I was doing in the earlier program. Inside this loop, which is run from 1 to very large number of trials. It could be 10,000, 50,000, whatever. Each time I generate a random number, I calculate the value of dice, and I add 1 to that element. I increment that sum. What will happen now? If I run this trial 10,000 times, the first element will contain as many times dice throughout 1. Second will contain as many times dice throughout 2. Of course, the element number will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if all these numbers are roughly same, then I know that the random number generator is uniform. 
So here is the last slide which says if I run this uniformity check program for 6 lakh times. So if I run it for 6 lakh times, generally each number should approximately come up 1 lakh times. And this is the what is indicated by the generated numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are thrown 99,000 times, 1 lakh 83 times, 1 lakh 90 times, etc. You will agree that these numbers are roughly similar. And therefore, the numbers generated are indeed uniformly generated random numbers. We'll stop here now and we'll continue looking at some problems using all this stuff in the next Thursday lecture. Thank you. Thank you.